Ah, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming along. Um, it's been a great pleasure this week uh, visiting Spain and, and talking to everyone about the SKA and in particular some of the, uh, the, the exciting uh, potential for Spanish involvement in the SKA, ranging from both the instrumental side through to the renewable energy which we visited yesterday that was so much fun. So I'm going to talk to you um, primarily about ASCAP, which is one of the SKA Pathfinder telescopes, and um, uh, present a few results from it, and also to show you a little bit about what the telescope is, um, what's unique about it, uh, where it is. I think that's very important because of the relationship to the SKA, and just a little bit of some of the early results. <laughs> So uh, a little bit of background first. I'm with CSIRO in Australia. CSIRO is the um, primary large federal research facility. Um, it's about 4,500 staff. Uh, within that, there is about 300 staff associated with the Astronomy and Space Sciences Unit called CAS. And we're responsible for building and running a number of uh, facilities in Australia. Uh, the Park 64 metre dish, the Australia Telescope Compact Array, uh, of course, ASCAP now in Western Australia. And we also operate the Deep Space Network for um, NASA in Australia. Uh, and at the same as the, there's a Spanish involvement here in operating one of the Deep Space Network stations outside Madrid. OK, uh, we have telescopes in a number of sites over here in uh, Eastern Australia. So the Compact Array, MOPRA, the Park 64 metre, NASA's base, and the new, of course, uh, ASCAP telescope out here in Western Australia, as well as facilities in the nearby town of Geraldton. OK, so what is AS ASCAP? ASCAP is a survey telescope that's very much motivated by the SKA. So the thinking behind the construction of ASCAP was that it would be a very early kind of instrument that was the same type of science that you would do with SKA, but at a much smaller level, of course. So SKA formed a lot of the thinking behind it. However, we were very keen for ASCAP to be an independently very powerful science instrument, even if SKA never happened. So we had to make sure that ASCAP by itself would be a standalone telescope that could be very powerful. Uh, SKA, I think most of you are familiar with, so I won't go into it in much detail. It's about 10 countries, hopefully expanding at the moment, about 650 million euros for the capital cost our uh, two primary components, the mid-frequency telescope in South Africa and the low-frequency telescope in uh, Western Australia. And I won't really get into much detail on that. So the primary science goals for SKA were these six areas, um, many of the, the big cosmology questions that science is facing. And for ASCAP, we were hoping to be... Oh, what happened? Ah, so for ASCAP... Um, I, I moved some slides around and I forgot. Uh, we've got a much smaller telescope, of course, in SKA. So we've got 36 12-metre antennas, a novel three-axis mount, which I'll explain in a minute, about six-kilometre baselines, and a very unique radio camera. And with that instrument, we hope to be able to address at least some of these four questions. We can't do them in the same depth, of course, as SKA, but we can make some progress in, the, in these areas. And in particular, looking back, at about a billion years of the universe's age, and then some of the much more recent uh, from about five billion up to quite recent periods. So the kind of survey science that we want to do with ASCAP has a number of technical requirements. So for the high spectral and time resolution, we need very good digital signal processing. For the continuum sensitivity, we need to have very low noise receivers. The spatial resolution, we want about 10 arc seconds of resolution. So that means about five kilometre baselines at this frequency. For very good polarisation, so for the magnetic field studies, which are very important, we need very high receiver element isolation. For the high dynamic range, we need very high performance A to Ds. And of course, to be able to map the entire visible sky, we had to generate the first radio camera. And that's really what's unique about the ASCAP telescope. Um, I'll make a, a set of these slides available to people, so I won't go through a lot of the technical uh, in much detail, but if anyone's interested, they can have a PDF of the slide set. So we've got, um, again, 36 dishes, uh, 630 pairs of dishes, which means, in fact, our, um, our imaging uh, quality is extremely high. We sample in the UV plane very well. 10 arc second resolution, 
um, 300 megahertz of bandwidth down here at the uh, H1 and redshift at H1 frequency band. Uh, very good spectral resolution, 16,000 uh, separate spectral channels. And uh, again, the, the, the key thing is that we have a, a radio camera with a focal plane of about 188 elements. So it has a very high field of view. How big? There's a well-known galaxy. There is the moon for scale. And what ASCAP can see in a single image is this entire screen, basically. So it's about 30 square degrees. So we can take images of a huge section of the sky uh, in, in a single snapshot without moving the antennas. The architecture um, is fairly simple, uh, but of course it's, it's very complex behind that, but 36 12 metre dishes, a phased ray feed, the radio camera up here at prime focus, the radio frequency signals are modulated directly onto a fibre optic cable, uh, and that's fed back all the way to the control building. We then digitise it, filter it, uh, go through beam formers, uh, generate the array covariance matrix, and then through to the, the correlator, and then out uh, through a dedicated fibre optic about 800 kilometres to our supercomputer down in Perth. On the science side, um, we have a, a, number of a, a number of science projects already uh, associated with the telescope. Um, these 10 science projects here, uh, we've allocated around about 75% of observing time for the next five years. Um, however, I would very much like to encourage you, A, if any of these are of interest, to please um, feel free to join. These groups, there's about 360 <coughs> astronomers associated with all of these research programs, but they're always looking for more people to join. And uh, the data that comes out of these programs will be available through our archive. Uh, in addition, about 25% of observing time on ASCAP will be available in, the, in the, what I call the traditional way to best proposal. Um, rather unusually, many of our astronomers decided to name their, their programs after Australian birds or Australian animals, and uh, so we have uh, all of the critical uh, animals shown there. So uh, one of the characteristics of ASCAP that's very, un that's very important is that we want to have extremely good signal-to-noise and high dynamic range. Now, with a, with a radio telescope with a single pixel, you have fixed side lobes on the sky, scattering effects, that, that you don't have to worry too much about as you track objects across the sky. But with a big radio camera in the focal plane, if those side lobes rotate on the sky, if the parallactic angle is changing, this is something that is, a, as we think, is a major problem when you're trying to get very high dynamic range, very high signal to noise. So there are two ways we could fix that. One was to have an equatorial telescope mount, so there was no rotation in the focal plane. The other is to basically rotate the entire antenna, the entire reflector of the telescope, as it tracks. So it's got a traditional out as mount, and then in addition, the reflector itself can rotate so that on the sky there is no parallactic angle rotation. And we found that that works extremely well. Um, it's not, unfortunately, quite visible in this image uh, here, but here is uh, with our normal observing um, and just four sources, uh, and this is when we're rotating the dish as it goes across the sky, and this is with the roll axis disabled, but where we have then tried in software to remove some of the side lobe artefacts and it's very, very difficult. The multi-beaming aspect of the telescope, the fact that we've got 188 elements forming beams on the sky, um, one initially thinks, well, that means you can have just a nice, simple, regular image on the sky, but in fact it also allows you to point beams in uh, arbitrary locations. So we've been experimenting just a little bit with that. So, for example, we've pointed beams in this location and managed to make this image. We can also arrange the beams so they're in a long line, uh, and that's particularly useful for, for looking at certain objects that might have a relationship to each other. And uh, we can, of course, also then just have them in a normal relationship. So this is an area of the sky called the Takana region. It's uh, three 12-hour observations um, at the low frequency end of our band, about 150 square degrees. And in this image, there are 3,722 galaxies. And up there in the corner, is the, the moon, just to give you a sense of scale here. 
So I should also point out that although it's three 12-hour observations, this was done with only six of our antennas operating. So it's one-sixth of the capability uh, of the, the full array. So it's extremely exciting in terms of the, the type of survey observation that we'll be able to, to perform with ASCAP. OK, so where is the telescope? You're all familiar with the, the map of Australia, of course. Sydney over here on the east coast, Perth on the west coast. We come north to Geraldton and inland to a region called the Murchison. The, the Murchison district here, this is the area of local government, uh, call it the, the province, is about 41,000 square kilometres. Inside that, uh, that, that local area, there are only 29 farms or pastoral stations. These are extremely large areas uh, of, of activity, typically sheep or cattle ranching. Um, so in that large area, 41,000 square kilometres, which is about the same size as the Netherlands. Here's the Netherlands for scale. But we have a population of about 120 people, if, if, if everybody's at home, I should add. Uh, and uh, it, it, whereas, of course, the Netherlands is uh, about, what, 16 and a half million, I think. So you can get the sense of how incredibly remote this is. Uh, there are no paved roads, there are no uh, grid electricity, there's no, um, there's no communication, no telephones, anything like that. <laughs> So I did, uh, uh, here is the outline within that area of the Bellardi station. So the station uh, where we have put the observatory site at the moment is called Bellardi. Uh, it's about 3,600 square kilometres, uh, about 360,000 hectares. And uh, over the next couple of years, uh, this observatory site where ASCAP is located will be expanded to the whole of this Bellardi uh, station to become this, the site for SKA in Australia. Um, now, I've, I've converted this and placed it on top of uh, Spain. I apologise that I did it on Madrid and I hadn't had time to do it down here in the south on Granada. But this does give you a sense of the, the size of the observatory site from nearly to Toledo, uh, nearly up here to uh, north of Madrid to Segovia. So uh, it, it's a very large area. Of course, why have we gone there? Well, I think everyone knows all the problems in both optical and radio astronomy these days. In optical, we have to move away from cities with light pollution. In radio astronomy, it's very much the same. We, we have to move away from the sources of radio frequency interference, our computers, our telephones, our car, our ignition systems. Everything generates so much noise. So we having to move out, and uh, the wilds of Western Australia, like uh, the Karoo in South Africa, is a long way from a, a much of this man-made activity. So it's really the future of, of low-frequency radio astronomy on the planet. Here's a, a, a small sample, some frequency space, 700 to 1,000 megahertz, uh, just a short period of time. And you can see that there's no RFI in here at all. During the day, we had one of our technicians turn on his cell phone. So this is just his cell phone turned on. And you can see the, the very strong signal that is uh, detected by the antennas. What is a little hard to see on the screen here, I'm afraid, um, is down here, there is a cell phone tower. About That's the nearest tower. It's just on 150 kilometres away. That tower was trying to talk to this cell phone. Uh, unfortunately, it failed, so that was good. But um, it, it shows uh, the site is otherwise extremely good in terms of uh, RFI. The government has recognised the importance of this, that... that Radio frequency interference is a radio quiet site is in fact a precious resource on the planet now and it has protected the, the site uh, through the federal government, this organisation, the Australian Communications and Media Authority and it has implemented a series of uh, uh, rings around the telescope site uh, and in which we have significant control over the types of activities that can be done in here to make sure that we keep the site quiet. Uh, here are some of the, the government acts. Uh, the Section 19, the Western Australian Government, has also implemented some acts, as well as this federal act to uh, limit activities in the region. OK, now a little bit about the telescope itself, of course. So I'll go through the antenna part quite quickly. Uh, it's just big steel antennas. These are 12 metres in diameter. This is them being fabricated uh, in a facility in China. Uh, they're tested here and then disassembled. Each antenna fits into a... Uh, three 40-foot shipping containers delivered out to site in Western Australia. We unpack them and assemble them in about uh, 12 days, 10 to 12 days, and uh, have an antenna quite quickly. Um, I described a little bit earlier the systems architecture. The exciting thing here, of course, 
is this phased array feed, this radio camera that's so, so unique. And uh, it sits up here at the prime focus of the antenna. Uh, it's not so obvious here, I'll show in a minute, you can see the individual pixels on the front of the camera here, which is about 1.2 meters in diameter. So it has 94 pixels um, of dual polarization, so 188 total, uh, 30 square degrees. We're aiming for about a 50 degree Kelvin system temperature. We're a little higher than that at the moment, but that's where we're hoping to get to. But uh, critically, this is done without cryogenics. One of the, the big areas of research we've been pursuing is how to do this kind of uh, uh, radio receiver without the very expensive and power consuming uh, cryogenic receivers. So the actual receiver up here, looking down at the dish surface, you can see uh, you can see the individual pixels here. We don't think of these as pixels if you're used to CCDs and optical cameras, but at radio frequencies, this is about the right size for a pixel. Um, this is very ordinary printed circuit board material, and these dark square patches are the copper pixels. They're effectively, they're, they're antennas. So the way the telescope operates is that between the corner of neighbouring uh, elements here, we take one wire from that corner, one wire from this corner, they go back to a different, the input of a differential low noise amplifier, and basically these two units next to each other become a dipole antenna. Uh, so the whole array is called a connected dipole antenna, but remarkably it has very, very good element to element isolation, around 30, 35 decibel dB of isolation. And so this gives you your 188 <coughs> elements, pixels on the sky. I must get a new version of this photo because this looks really messy. Uh, when we, this was the very first prototype and uh, when he was doing the cabling, uh, it looks like that. Now it's very tidy, much better. So this is, this is the back side, this is the front there, we now do them in white, but the back side of that uh, has all of these gold boxes with the low noise amplifiers in it and then all of these uh, fiber optic cables uh, where the signals come out only on fiber optics. So we have the only copper cables around here uh, the low voltage uh, monitoring control signals. All of the signal uh, that comes out of the receiver is done directly on fiber optic. We have a massive production line, um, both uh, at a neighboring facility in Newcastle and uh, down at our own facility in Sydney. Uh, typically we have about five of these being manufactured at once and uh, many of the electronic components coming from an electronic company up north. And then uh, after they're constructed and tested in an anechoic chamber in Sydney to make sure that uh, the performance is adequate and they don't generate uh, too much RFI themselves, we uh, mount, send them out to Western Australia and install them up onto the antenna as we're doing here. You can see aspects of uh, the terrain around here remind me a little the, the, the south of Spain here in terms of how dry it is and the, the rather sparse uh, vegetation. Um, the performance uh, is uh, quite good. This is actually a TCS on ETA on, on, on uh, the efficiency of the dish. It's not the pure TCS number. And we're quite pleased that we're down here around about the 80 degree to 90 degree level across our full 1800 to 800 band. Uh, so we think that we'll get down to about 70, um, which is what we need for the TCS itself to get down to 50. Um, and we're, at the moment, we're very pleased with this, this performance level. Of course, one of the downsides of having a radio camera is the number of pixels has gone up. And so with the number of pixels going up, the amount of data goes up. So we have 188 detectors in the focal plane. We're looking at 300 megahertz of bandwidth, which we're digitizing at one and a half giga samples a second, 12-bit digitization, 16,000 spectral channels, 36 antennas. That means our raw data rate is 100 terabits per second. That's one of those numbers that's kind of meaningless. You kind of know it's big, but what, what does that really mean? So I've converted that to something a bit more um, accessible. So that's the equivalent of 3,000 of your worst movies every second, or uh, a stack 62 kilometers tall of Blu-ray discs each day, uh, or it's also equal to the entire internet bandwidth around the world in June of 2012. That's when the, the, the internet went through that 100 terabit per second sort of barrier. So the raw data rate into our, our computing facility is truly astounding. And this is typical of where certainly radio astronomy is going and, and optical astronomy in different ways, I think. But radio astronomy is becoming massively, massively data oriented. And it's why we're also seeing 
uh, a great deal of engagement in the radio astronomy community with groups like IBM, with Cray, with the supercomputer organizations, because we're pushing uh, their computing uh, abilities, not so much in terms of our data file size, but in terms of our continuous data rate, and they're very interested in aspects of that. So we take the, the signal from the phase ray feed, um, two and a half terabits from each antenna times 36. We run it through our beamformer. This is just part of the beamformer system into the correlator. And then it goes down this fibre here from the telescope site where the correlator is to the supercomputer down in Perth. Um, and it depends a little bit on the type of science, the type of observation, but between 10 and 40 gigabits per second we run down that 800 kilometre fibre to, to the Pawsey supercomputer where this spray machine is. Now for us, the Pawsey supercomputer facility is actually a critical part of the telescope. Again, in many cases, people, the, 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 the telescope and the data are stored and, and you can then take it to a, a, a supercomputer at your leisure offline to, to do the analysis. For the data rate that we have, we cannot store the raw data products. So the Cray supercomputer um, that's called, Cascade, uh, called Galaxy, it's a Cascade series machine, uh, here it is in, in all its glory, um, it runs at about 1.3 uh, petaflops, and uh, that's an absolutely critical part of our data. So the data has to come into that machine, get uh, partially reduced in real time, so the UV plane, the UV images are taken and just converted simply into a, a more traditional spectral cube with um, spatial coordinates and velocity or, or spectral coordinates. And we also have a 40 petabyte tape library uh, in this facility in Perth that's uh, an important part of the project. Okay, so a little bit about the site now, the site infrastructure. This is partly around not only the ASCAP telescope, but also uh, gives you a flavour for uh, what will be required for SKA, although SKA scale, of course, is significantly bigger. At the moment, we have it's, the MRO is about 126 square kilometres. That will grow to the full 3,600 uh, of Bilardi Station. Um, there's 32 kilometres of roads. On site here, we have 16,000 kilometres of optical fibre. So again, it's just a reminder of how much optic fibre is needed to transport this volume of data. We have a very specialised control building with the correlator in it, 800 square metres, and a power station is just being installed at the moment. Uh, it's a solar diesel hybrid with about 1.1 megawatt uh, peak requirement. So the building, um, here's the centre of the telescope area. The building is this very uh, rather boring, uninteresting looking building over here, um, and it is uh, what's special about it is that we've gone out to this remote site to get away from all the radio frequency interference that we generate with, with our cars and our phones, but we've put out, out at the site a huge amount of uh, high power digital electronics. They radiate an enormous amount of RFI. So we have to shield the, the telescopes out here from the RFI that's being generated in here. So the whole building is in fact a completely shielded Faraday cage with then RFI proof doors going in and out. So every critical entrance in and out of the building is in fact two doors, sort of like an, uh, an, an airlock or a submarine. So you can have one door always closed and absolutely keep the facility um, shielded. And there's just some of the electronics that would be right inside the middle of the building. We'll be taking the, the same approach to the um, the, the control building uh, or the correlator, the processing building for the uh, SKA low <coughs> antenna, which will be on a site about 18 kilometres away from here. <coughs> As I said, we're in the process at the moment of installing a, a fairly large um, a, a solar diesel hybrid power station. Uh, this power station uh, has about a 1.1 megawatt requirement. Um, we're installing 1.6 uh, megawatt solar panel, sorry, uh, about a 1.6 megawatt solar panel and about 2.5 megawatt hours of lithium battery. Uh, this combination with the diesel generators will allow us to uh, optimise the system so that we can use as much renewable solar energy as we can running into the night with the solar battery, with, with, the, with the battery system. So we're very excited about the potential for this um, for one of, in one of the first cases for a big science instrument to have a significant renewable energy source. 
And this sets an interesting precedent that the SKA will, will be following up on, I think. Other infrastructure, um, of course, we have the fibre optic link all the way to Geraldton and on to Perth. We have a small building in Geraldton. Uh, we have the supercomputer down in Perth and a science operations centre in Sydney. That's where we primarily operate the telescope from over at the CSIRO headquarters in, in Sydney. OK, just a little bit now about uh, some early results. As I said, um, the telescope, uh, most of these results come from when we've had just six of the antennas with our very first Mark I phased array feeds on them, so one-sixth of them populated in this configuration. Uh, so it's been fairly limited. But it's been very exciting what we've been able to do. So putting beams around uh, a fairly crowded field, all these different galaxies. From this, we've been able to generate the continuum maps and, of course, look at the, the dynamics of each of these galaxies. Here we have the H1 velocity curves, and you can see the rotation. And again, this is a relatively short integration. We were able to get these galaxies um, in, I believe, this was a four-hour integration. Uh, so the full ASCAP instrument will be truly amazing in terms of its ability to map these. Uh, here's a 700 megahertz to um, just over a gigahertz, um, fairly a 300 megahertz of spectral uh, bandwidth. Um, on this particular location, what we were doing here was sort of looking at the RFI, but one of the things that was interesting was to detect a new galaxy. Here's an H1 absorption line uh, at modest redshift, um, and so that was very exciting. These areas here of uh, radio frequency interference are satellite-based, so they're fairly typical around the world. Um, and they're, they're things that we really can't get away from very easily. But you can see how nice the rest of the spectrum is there. Uh, galaxy evolution. So here's uh, two merging galaxies. Um, on the right is the, the data from the Park 64 metre dish. Um, and on the left here is the data from just six of the ASCAP dishes. So we'll get significantly better signal to noise than at Parks once it's completed. Plus, of course, instead of just seeing this one small area of the sky at once that we could with Parks, we'll be able to map a, a large area. Again, um, here's an interesting, the Large Magellanic Cloud. Here's the Large Magellanic Cloud uh, uh, on, on a similar scale. And again, we were able to map this entire field very, very quickly. And uh, one, one other source, uh, Supernova uh, 1987A. Uh, this is from the Sydney University Molongo survey. Uh, this is uh, the object here in 1998. And this is uh, a six-hour observation, I believe, taken last year um, of the same, the same supernova. This took a significant time. I don't know how long, I'm afraid, but it was a significant time to map this whole source. But because of our, our radio camera capability, this was a, just a short, single snapshot image. One of the um, very interesting features of our ability to steer beams on the sky uh, is that, for example, um, if we have a satellite in our field of view or even slightly outside our, our field of view that is creating a lot of RFI, we can steer a beam onto that and we can then take that, that information and null out the RFI. So here is a, an image where you can see there is significant contamination of the image from RFI. Here is our first attempt to basically null that out. And uh, we're very excited about the potential for this long term, not just for ASCAP but in other areas as well. And again, uh, finally, um, here's uh, the Australia Telescope Compact Array, which many of you will know about. That's uh, six 22-metre dishes in northern New South Wales with cryogenic receivers. 96 hours of observing on this source. And again, here is, for example, two hours with our beta, our six antennas, uh, Mark I receivers. And you can see it's at least an acceptable map, again, in just a, a short period of time. With full 36 antennas, we'll have uh, significantly better performance than the compact array in much, much shorter time. And of course, we'll be mapping much bigger areas of the sky. So really, we're, we're very excited about ASCAP as a survey instrument. Uh, we've managed to achieve many of the, the characteristics that we think are absolutely critical to achieve all of our science. And um, during the next, during the next uh, few months, we'll be installing more of the receivers. So we've got nine of our new systems on now. Uh, we aim to have 12 by the end of next month. Running right through this year, we'll have them all completed. And uh, we start early science uh, in about quarter three of this year with 12 of the antennas, progressing through next year into full science in 2017, later in 2017.
I'll just skip through these in the interest of time. I would like to just uh, have a plug for, we have a, a Future of Radio Astronomy Surveys conference called ASCAT 2016, Survey Science in, in Sydney, this conference at, um, uh, in early June. And uh, I'd, I'd like to encourage anyone interested in any of our primary science fields or radio science to, to uh, attend this conference. Thanks very much. It, 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 it really is. helps you put, put, put the time in your head. Uh, I have one question. Do you, uh, for the observations that you do with better, <coughs> if you observe for 10 hours, how long does it take right now in computing time for processing? It, it's, it's, at right now it's very quick because we only, have, we only have six antennas, so that's one sixth of the number of antennas, so it's one thirty sixth of the uh, basically, num the number of cross correlation channels. So it's by around lunchtime the next day, all of that night's data would be would be processed quite straightforwardly. But um, as we build up, we need to be on close to a one to one, and uh, the we're, what we're learning a lot about improving our efficiency of our algorithms. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, we're quite, I would say, touch wood. We're <laughs> quite sure that we'll we'll be able to basically be in that mode by that within 12 to 18 hours of the, the observation, the data will come in, be coming out of the pipeline in, the, in its reduced state. Because we only have a limited buffer size of disk to be able to store that much data. Trivial question, though. Uh, it's about the derotation of, of the observations. I'm an I'm infrared optical astronomer, so basically I'm familiar with yep, yep. derotate. Um, still, I'm not so familiar with radio observations. So, if you have a single pixel radio detector, probably you do not need to do that, right? Correct. It's just a problem of the camera to then really know exactly what your beam is at each instant, and you can clean it up easier. Is that correct? Yes, because with 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 a, a, a an imaging detector in the focal plane. You have two effects. Firstly, you have, uh, or primarily, you have pixels that are not on the central axis. So, as they're further off axis, the uh, side lobes from the quadrupod supporting legs become more complex. And trying to remove those in post processing software, we, we feel when we're trying to get nearly 100 dB signal to noise, 100,000 to 1 ratio of signal to noise, we, we simply can't do that. So, we, we have started experimenting uh, a little bit to see what we can do, but at the moment we feel that the, the rotating the dish is still our best, our best approach. And do you have also problems with, um, if you want to have, uh, for example, small angular separation, so you, you, you clean your images, so you need to know your beam very well. Yes. How well do you know your beam? Do you calibrate, do you take PSF references as we do in optical astronomy? I mean, you could have what we call yeah. speckle noise in the side lobes because of non-perfectly antenna. Do you do that? We, it, this is, in fact, one of the biggest areas of learning. Because there's never been a telescope like this before, we, we've spent, we, we installed these six, you see we, we refer to it as beta with our Mark I system. We installed those primarily at, to learn how to do this sort of thing because the calibration is absolutely critical, particularly for the magnetic, uh, for the polarisation characteristics. At the moment, we're, we're finding that uh, what we call the beam weights, how we add up the information from neighbouring pixels to form the individual beams. They seem to be stable for about one night, uh, but we don't quite understand at what point the stability changes, what causes it to suddenly change. We can calibrate quite simply at the moment from, from strong radio sources, but in fact we've installed just last month on one of the dishes a small calibration device, and we've just started the work now to see if by using a our own uh, uh, generated signal uh, to see if that will allow us to calibrate a bit more frequently and uh, with bit higher signal to noise as well. But the whole, it, the, you're right, the point spread function is the equivalent uh, is, uh, of what we're trying to understand with our beam function here. My question was going to be exactly on the polarization calibration. Uh, yeah, I presume that it is not. Uh, 
For, for spatial position, you mean? Uh, for CQR, uh, sorry, for uh, both linear and CQR polarization, both uh, uh, on axis and off axis. I'm trying to remember the numbers. I, look, can I? I'll look them up. I think we're looking for about 1% mm -hmm. polarization purity, but I'll have to check that. I'll have to check that. Yeah. Bob Salt is our, do you know, I don't know if you know, Bob Salt is our polarization expert here, but I think he, I, I, I'll, but I'll, I'll look those numbers up for you. That's not my area at all. So uh, for the early science, it's, it's actually going to be a, a bit of a, a mix. We've got, um, there's 10 big science survey projects, but um, luckily many of them are, are, are commensal. They will use the same data. So there's two projects in particular, uh, EMU and Wallaby, that we'll be taking the data for probably about 60% of the time during early science and at 60% of the available time, because um, not all the time will be available. We're commissioning the telescope still. But there'll be some time available for new projects as well. So if you're interested in a new project uh, that doesn't map into one of our current science survey teams, please do contact me or our project scientist, Lisa Harvey-Smith, because we're, we're, we're interested in testing the telescope with some of the, the more interesting and challenging science problems. So basically, it's, it's open at the moment. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks once again for the invite. Um, it's really fantastic to be here. We've had a wonderful week in Spain, and I'm certainly going to be coming back for a holiday at some point soon. Um, it's really a beautiful country. And I think we've also engaged a lot of the Spanish industry um, with the IAA this week, the ministry, and um, it's really looking positive in terms of um, the contribution of Spain to the SKA. So today, my presentation is primarily going to focus on the construction progress of Mercat, ASCAP is uh, fortunately already up, um, and you sort of starting with early science, where Meerkat is currently being constructed in the Karoo. So I'm just going to give you more of an update in terms of progress of the infrastructure, the um, establishment of the observatory, um, and then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the AVN, which is a new project being launched by SKA South Africa. It's the African VLBI network in preparation for SKA Phase 2 in the African partner countries. All right, so the overview will just be to touch on how we've established the observatory in the Karoo. Um, I'll also talk about the infrastructure and the upgradability for SKA Phase 1. Um, I'll then look at the Meerkat telescope in terms of the schedule, and, as well as the SKA schedule. Um, there's quite exciting things happening at the moment in terms of the antenna manufacture and installation on site. And then also just touch on the progress in terms of the remaining subsystems um, of the telescope. And then lastly, a few updates on the progress of the African VLBI network. So just to give you a sense of where we are, this is the map of South Africa. Um, this is the Northern Cape province. Um, the Karoo is located here. This map shows the population density of South Africa. So the blue is high population density, and the white area is obviously low population density. And this is one of the primary reasons why South Africa was selected as one of the host countries for the SKA, due to that low population de density, amongst others. And it's also got very good tropospheric and ionospheric conditions um, in the Karoo. Um, our ministers also published what we call in South Africa the Astronomy Geographic Advantage Area Act. This is new legislation that's been promulgated to protect the whole observatory in the Karoo. 
And it also gives the Minister of Science and Technology the power um, to restrict any future development in that area. So she can provide and um, um, monitor any sort of inhibiting or things that could inhib inhibit the observatory. Just to give you a sense of what the site actually looked like in 2008, um, there's pretty much not much happening there. Um, so this was a LIDAR survey that was taken in 2008, and this was the survey taken in 2014. So you can see there's a bit of progress in terms of the actual facilities on site. This is what we call our site complex. So it's all the dish assembly facilities, our power facility on site, as well as our array processor building, which where all our data is processed um, and transported to Cape Town. This is what the Meerkat core site looked like in 2008, and this is what it looks like. In fact, this is an old picture in 2014. In 2016, you'll see there's a number of dishes now in the core area as well. In terms of the CAT7 phase, um, uh, Anne mentioned there's a population of 120 um, close to your site. We've got a little town called Carnarvon, um, which is just outside our site, about 90 kilometers. Our population is slightly larger. We've got 4,000 people there. About 10 kilometers from Carnarvon, we've got our engineering support base, and that's where our technicians and our operators do maintenance. So it's uh, quite a distance away from the main site. And then we've got the Meerkat site, which is also co-located with the SKA core site, uh, which is about 80 kilometers. We've got this new road that we're busy sealing at the moment, and we've got our overhead power line and our optic fiber cable running through to the site. Right, so I'm going to sort of start from the beginning, where we started the acquisition of the land in 2008. So we currently own two farms, 14,000 hectares. That's only sufficient for the Meerkat radio telescope. Um, the province also upgraded the provincial road to site to give us good access. Uh, this is our engineering operations centre, which is just outside Carnarvon, um, which was um, basically upgraded. And at that point in time, there was no access to power, so we had to use diesel generators on site and also at the support base. We then started with the construction of our dish assembly facilities. Um, at that point, CAT7 was a composite fibre dish, a 12-metre centre-fed fibre dish. So all the actual moulding of the, the dish happened on site. So this was our dish assembly and sort of manufacturing facility which was constructed for CAT7. Again, access roads and antenna foundations for, for CAT7. In terms of access to power, we've decided that we were, it was at that point easier to construct our own power line. We have got access to the national utility in South Africa, so we've constructed a new 33 kV power line, uh, which gives us up to 5.2 megawatts of power available on site. So for Meerkat, we're currently using about 2 megawatts, and the remainder of the power is available for SKA Phase 1. You can see the design of the power line. We've actually, for the first 30 kilometers, um, designed um, a, a steel monopole structure. It's quite a unique design in terms of power um, because it gives better earthing protection um, and lightning protection um, for the power line. We then transition to a wooden pole structure because of affordability reasons. We've also upgraded the substation just outside Carnarvon and this gives us 10 megawatts of capacity from the town through to the site. In terms of our long haul fibre for Meerkat, at the moment we don't have a redundant network. We've got a spur network. Um, it's a 10 gigabit per second link running from the site through to Cape Town. At the moment we're investigating upgrading that 10 gigabit per second link to 20 gigabits per second for Meerkat. So essentially what we do is we actually run the optic fibre from site all on the overhead power line to the town of Carnarvon. This is our point of presence in Carnarvon. And then we trench the fibre uh, on the railway line all the way to Cape Town. Okay, for Meerkat, this is what the site looked like again in 2014. It has changed a little bit now. So we've constructed all the roads in the core for Meerkat. All the platforms around the dishes is, is completed. The antenna foundations is there. All the fibre network, the, the power cabling, everything is trenched um, and it's ready for the installation and connection up to the dishes. Just to give you a sense of SKA1, so this is the Meerkat core on the site. And what we're going to be doing is co-locating the core of SKA Phase 1 with Meerkat. Um, and we're just going to be extending the infrastructure. So all the green dots, it's a bit difficult to see, but the green dots are Meerkat and the blue dots are SKA Phase 1. We've also constructed a landing strip on site to give easy access to our engineers from Cape Town and Johannesburg. Once again, fiber networks installed. Um, and for Meerkat, what we decided to do is we actually expanded the construction facilities on site. Um, you can see the extension of the dish assembly shed and new pedestal integration <coughs> shed. And the reason for that is that we want to increase the production rate in terms of the assembly of dishes for Meerkat. 
The intention is also to use this for phase one of the SKA. Once again, our engineering operations center um, and the actual power facility on site and the data processing center. So, like Ant mentioned, they do a lot of RFI shielding around the entire building um, in Australia. For Mierkat, we've got um, our RFI shielding around the data rack area where all the primary noise is generated from the data racks. So, you can see we made a conscious decision when we designed Mierkat that we actually wanted to expand it easily for the phase one of SKA. So, we've actually created enough space. Um, we've got 50 racks here for Mierkat and the remainder is available for phase one of the SKA. We've also got our maser room where our clocks are going to be, our maser clocks, um, which will be reused for phase one. And then our power facility adjacent to this, we've got uh, three rotary UPS units which provides um, backup and uninterrupted power supply. At the moment, um, we can have 6.5 MVA capacity um, for the full phase one of the SKA. So that's just a picture of what the data rack area looked like um, with the first racks being installed. At the moment, we've got all the Mercat racks installed on site. And these are diesel rotary UPS engines in the site complex. Once again, we had to construct the foundations for Mercat. Um, so big concrete reinforced pile caps with um, sort of big concrete piles going down. And this was the first pull test that we did to check that we actually met the, um, the pointing budget. And we were allocated five arc seconds for the foundation. We did the pull test and we've confirmed that the actual foundation meets the, the specifications. At the moment, we're busy with the land expansion program for phase one of the SKA. So we're going to be acquiring another 36 farms in the core area, um, which will give us about an additional 120,000 hectares of land um, available. And I think you've got 360,000 hectares, so we're probably half of your size um, in the core area. So this is the sort of area that we're going to be acquiring for phase one of the SKA, and that's what the configuration for phase one will look like. So this is the core area um, which we'll acquire, and then we've got these antennas going on the spiral arms out to baselines about 120 kilometres, um, and we'll just secure servitudes um, on these sections there. Right, in terms of Mercat, our vision in 2012, we had seven objectives. Um, we've achieved probably five of them already, and the rest is we're waiting for the completion of construction. <laughs> so one of the first objective is a world-class instrument that exceeds the original specified baseline requirements, and I'll show you in the next few slides that we've done that. It's the first use of an offset Gregorian dish um, in radio telescope. Um, that's been achieved. An instrument that will consider, be considered the benchmark for performance and reliability to the scientific community at large. We're waiting. So we're first constructing Mercat and we'll see if we can achieve that. Um, delivery of the full specification Mercat within schedule and budget. Um, at the moment we're within schedule, we're within budget. Um, we still have two years <coughs> to see if we can achieve that. We also want to be a true precursor for the SKA that will be integrated into the mid dish array. As you can see from the slides I've shown you, we've achieved that. We also want to execute large surveys for Mercat um, in terms of the science programs. Um, we'll talk about that now. And then lastly, to extract or attract an exceptionally skilled team that demonstrates passion, dedication and commitment to Mercat and the SKA delivery while also having a bit of fun while we do it. And that's hopefully um, we've all got an exciting team that's, that's um, part of the project. This just shows the timelines. Obviously, we follow a very rigorous system engineering process. We had an experimental development model that was constructed at Hyde Hoop um, in 2006. We then developed the engineering prototype for Mercat, which is called CAT7, which is the composite fiber 12 centimeter, of 12 meter offset or center fair dish. And then we've got Mercat, which is the SKA Pathfinder, which is the 64 dish array, 13.5 uh, meter offset Gregorian. We split it into two phases. The first phase, um, you can see we've got, well, we've got baselines of 8 kilometers and minimum baselines of 29 meters. Um, what you can see here in red is we've actually shifted the, um, the UHF band to phase one of the, the, the Mierka project um, because we've improved the, the um, sensitivity. I'll show that in the following slides, which improves our science capability for Mierka. In terms of our schedule, at the moment, as it stands this week, we've installed 16 antennas on site, and five and six are currently being integrated. By the end of March, we'll have 21 structures on site. And the big one for us, in terms of array release one, is going to be 30 June 2016, when we have a 16 antenna array. So the first fringes um, will be obtained at the end of June. 
So, in fact, there's a sort of a standing joke at the moment that, it's not a joke, but all of our performance bonuses hinge on the, the achievement of this big milestone for us. So by the end of March 2017, we'll have 64 dishes, and then by March as well, we'll have array release too. Um, and then lastly, by December 2017, the 64 dish array, which is array release 3. In terms of schedule, at the moment, as I mentioned, we're in construction of Meerkat. It will be completed in 2017. Early signs starting in 2017 with full signs um, happening from 2018 on to 2023. Um, once again, we're also aligned with the construction or the beginning of construction of Meerkat, which starts, or SKA, which starts in 21, 2018 to 2023. So there's going to be a late integration of Meerkat into phase one of the SKA so that we can do the five-year um, Meerkat surveys. In terms of the Meerkat architecture, um, I think the unique thing here is the fact that the digitizer is actually located at the feed or actually at the receiver. Um, this was seen as quite a high risk in terms of radio frequency interference, um, but the design, we've actually done extensive testing. We've proven that it, um, it meets the required RFI levels. Um, and the advantage of this is that we reduce the length of the RF cable um, and also the, the actual losses, the, the signal losses. Um, signal transports, all the data gets transported on our fibre network on site. Um, and then all our correlated beamformers, the pulse of search and the pulse of time, is actually in the array processor building on site. The science data process is also co-located in the career array processor building. So that's a little bit different to ASCAP where all our processing, actually, the correlation and processing happens on site. And then we've got our 10 gigabit per second link which goes through to Cape Town. In terms of Meerkat science, you can see these are the, the different surveys that have been planned for Meerkat. Um, the Spanish are very involved in, as we've heard this morning, mongoose and thundercat. Um, so you can see the five years that's been allocated um, for, for the Meerkat. This gives you a sense of the institutions involved in the Meerkat surveys. You can see Spain over here. So we've got about 360 individuals participating in the surveys and 121 institutes across the world. At the moment, there's a discussion that we actually want to refresh the, the Meerkat science case in May of 2016. So there's going to be an open invite to everybody to contribute to this, um, particularly because there's updated technical specifications and capabilities of Meerkat, which have now become evident through the design. Um, there's also new scientific results obtained since the time of the original proposals that were submitted. And then current or planned large programs and other facilities that could affect the international context of the project. And then lastly, the incorporation of Meerkat into phase one of the SKA. So there is an open invite out um, in May of this year, um, and there will be a number of workshops facilitated by Professor Justin Jonas and the PIs to, to arrange this. Just shows you the science capability in terms of particularly the L band. This was the original specification for the L band for Meerkat. Um, there's been a lot of testing done, and you can see there's been a big uh, increase in sensitivity um, in the L band um, for Meerkat. This is the UHF band. The S band is the second phase of Meerkat, which is the, um, the sort of 11 million euros that we've just been allocated by Max Planck Institute. So this is part of phase two um, of the Meerkat project. This just shows the receptor performance, a of a TSIS in the L band. This was the original specification um, where we had the actual telescope PDR. And at the moment, you can see in terms of function and frequency range, this was the specification, and this is currently what we're achieving, between two to four times um, increase in sensitivity of the telescope, um, which obviously improves the science capability considerably from the output. Again, this is the actual dish that's being constructed on site, and this just shows you the layout of the receiver, the indexer, the digitizers, and the services. Once again, you can see the digitizers located here, uh, right next to the, the receivers. Um, the L-band receiver at the moment is quite a small receiver in comparison to other L-band receivers in the world, and that's largely due to the innovative design in the OMT. Um, and at the moment, our, the company in South Africa, EMSS, is actually contributing to the international SKA uh, design of receivers for band two. Comparative sort of concept design between SKA phase one and Meerkat, you can see the design is fairly similar. Meerkat dish is slightly smaller than the phase one dish, um, but generally um, the actual architecture of Meerkat is very similar to phase one architecture. And that just reinforces the technology options and decisions that we made for Meerkat are in line with um, phase one of the SKA. I think this slide, just um, in terms of the actual Meerkat antenna specs, you can see we've actually done measurements now. 
And particularly around surface accuracy, um, we specified one millimeter surface accuracy. We're currently getting 0.6 millimeter accuracy, um, which will obviously improve the, the, um, the sensitivity as well. This is a construction of the pedestals um, happening in Johannesburg. There's a big factory being set up to construct the pedestals, so there's a whole line, production line happening at the moment. This is the machining of the pedestals. There's a separate factory being set up for the dish panelling. Um, we hope that this can be reused for phase one of the SKA. Again, a sub reflector factory, the integration of the receivers in Cape Town, just outside Cape Town. The sub reflector composite fibre, um, or carbon fibre, which is also being manufactured off site and shipped to the actual site. This is the facility on site where we've got the actual uh, backing structure and the reflectors which are being assembled in the shed and then shipped out to the site. So that's a picture of what it looks like moving the actual dish to the site. This is the installation of the pedestal on the foundation, backing structure and main reflector. Right, in terms of the digitizers, the L-band digitizer, this is the in-house development of SKA South Africa in Cape Town. The production facility has been set up and the UHF band digitizer, we're also currently um, sorting out the, the schedule for this. So that, that's just a picture of the actual manufacture and the integration of the digitizers in Cape Town. You'll see that it's also passive cooling um, in terms of the digitizer, so which, that limits the RFI and also reduces the maintenance um, during operations. Just a few more pictures in Cape Town. In terms of the receivers, um, I've spoken a little bit about this. Um, there's been independent verification from Canada, and it's uh, been sort of viewed as the best performing two-to-one receiver in the world. Um, and I've mentioned that EMSS is now currently involved in the SKA receiver development um, for Band 2. All right, this just shows the, um, the actual performance of the um, the receivers, what was originally specified in terms of our design goals and what we're currently achieving between 6 and 7. Okay. Again, receiver manufacturing in Stellenbosch. Uh, these are the control units for the receivers. Um, this is the actual compressor units for the receivers in Cape Town, the OMT, and the actual receivers being installed on the dishes. Correlator beam former, the correlator beam former switch has been installed on site and that's sufficient, has sufficient capacity for the final Mierkat project. Um, at the moment we've got Roach 2 installed um, in the facility and that should be sufficient for array release 1 which is a 16 dish array. And then what we're going to be doing is um, switching over to Scarab which is Roach 3 and that's the next generation of technology um, which will be sufficient for the final Mierkat project. This is just our optic fibre installation um, in the career rate processor building and on site. We've obviously done extensive RFI testing on the receivers. This is the actual compressor unit, the digitizer. You can see the digitizer results um, under this, the required levels and the actual pedestal uh, shielded door. Control and monitoring has also been managed and developed by SKA South Africa in Cape Town. We're on schedule there and that's all going well. This is just a picture of um, 12 of the dishes. Um, there are 16. Some of the outliers um, are about 8 kilometers um, outside of the core. And I think lessons learned from us, um, there's quite a few lessons learned. I think the biggest one is the importance of accurate and complete requirements, traceability. Um, we know that from system engineering. Um, cost of a change is going to cost someone. So there's always the saying in South Africa, no free lunch for anybody. Um, Okay, qualification is very good. Um, we need to be done very well. Proof of design that it meets the requirements. Definition of ICDs is critical. Um, logistics, that needs to be addressed during the design phase. We need a support team. We've actually got a whole operations team already on site looking at how we're delivering the, the Mirka telescope um, so that they can take over operations. And then a big one is integration between infrastructure and telescope. Um, that's quite a big one um, to ensure that that happens seamlessly. And then largely, I think, um, once you've delivered a telescope, the biggest thing is around the actual support afterwards. Um, paperwork, physical configuration, audits, support requests, and the whole logistical support analysis for the actual telescope. So in conclusion, I think um, generally everything is going very well in terms of Mierkat. The infrastructure is completed. We've set up good stakeholder relations in the community. Mierkat is uh, performing better than specification at the moment. We're also within cost, on schedule, we're involved in the international SKA. A lot of our teams are, of two teams, we're leading um, some of the consortia and we've got involvement throughout the other international consortia at the moment. 
Lastly, quickly, just to touch on the African VLBI network. Um, sorry, this is funded by the Newton Fund, um, the Royal Society and the African Renaissance Fund. Essentially, what we're doing is converting existing telecommunications dishes in some of the African partner countries. And you can see all the partner countries that are participating in phase two of the SKA. And all we're trying to do is we're trying to build institutional cap capital in our African partner countries so that they can um, help construct, operate, and maintain phase two of the SKA um, in the partner countries. And also develop a network of radio telescopes which are of interest to the global international community um, in Africa. Um, at the moment in Ghana, uh, we're focusing a large amount of effort in terms of the conversion of the Ghana 32-meter dish um, at Kutunsi. Um, so there's a lot of software-hardware integration happening in Cape Town. There's test rigs being uh, worked on, and then we're also working on the Met 4 grade weather station, which is needed for the VLBI um, facility. At the moment, there's discussion with the um, European VLBI network because we're working towards fringes um, on the Ghana telescope in September of this year. So we're hoping that we can um, work with the EVN on that. Um, yeah. And then I think there's quite a lot of tangible benefits out of um, Ghana. There was no astronomy, astrophysics in the past. We now set up a number of PhD um, MSc students that are participating in SKA South Africa. Um, and there's also an unprecedented interest from the Ghanaians in postgraduate post SKA bursaries. So there's been a lot of applications in SKA South Africa uh, to participate in the field of astronomy. Again, there's been a, a radio astronomy club launched, which has over 100 members. They meet weekly, talk about astronomy, um, and also about the physical um, challenges of um, construction of the conversion. This is the team in Ghana. Um, this is the, the riggers and painters that are busy with the conversion of this dish. It's another picture of them. And they're being funded by the Royal Society, so there's a lot of training happening in terms of the Ghanaians. Madagascar, we're talking to the Madagascar or Malagasy uh, stakeholders at the moment. We're looking at a conversion of a 30 meter antenna um, in Aravamama into, into a VLBI capable telescope. Um, at the moment, you can see um, we're going to probably have to change the optics of this telescope. And there's a big telecoms tower which will have to be removed um, on this site. Zambia, we're also looking at a conversion of the Mwembeshi telecoms dish, 29.6 meters. Again, there's an existing, you can see a big telecoms dish here that needs to be removed. So there's a whole investigation in terms of the feasibility of removing this um, tele telecoms mast. And then we're looking at new builds in Botswana, Mauritius and Namibia. At the moment, we're trying to map out how this is going to take place, what the costs are, site identification, quantification of costs, um, certainly. And then we're going to look at funding to, to start new builds in, in these countries. Um, so that's a bit of work that's underway at the moment. So in summary, I think the AVN is an exciting project of global scientific interest. It's a small team that's expanding considerably in Cape Town, but also in the African partner countries. And there's a very positive vibe in Africa and, and the partner countries to participate in astronomy. <coughs> so I think that's, in summary, where we are at the moment with Meerkat and the AVN. Um, I'd just like to say that I'm not a scientist or astronomer, so I ask for forgiveness. Um, <laughs> But I think in terms of, you know, in terms of Meerkat science, we'd, I'd gladly set you up with any discussions if you would like to pursue um, discussions on the Meerkat science and the update that's going to happen in May 2016. And then also if there's any, we heard this morning, there's a lot of technical development happening in the Institute. And if there's any discussions from a technical point that you'd like to set up with our subsystem managers on the telescope, we'd gladly set that up. Um, and if there's technical questions around the telescope subsystems, um, we can facilitate that on, um, for you. Yeah. I was wondering, but curiously, in relation to the act of the protection, yeah. Yeah. it was it was difficult for your organization, or it was already the government involved. Uh, uh, difficult to concern? It was, um, it's actually led by government, so the Department of Science and Technology, who <coughs> we report to, um, they led the initiative in terms of the, le the legislation, um, and they've been interacting with the Department of Communications in South Africa, and um, the cell phone providers, obviously that's a big issue in terms of cell phone transmitters um, in the area. So there's been a lot of engagement with them, the Civil Aviation Authority, and it's been a very public, sort of a, um, open engagement process with um, all the service providers um, that could be impacted on this. 
And at the moment, as we speak, the regulations are being developed and there's a public participation process happening in the Karoo um, to try and tell the, 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 the community in that area what the impact is in terms of the, the legislation and the promulgation of regulations. So it's quite an interesting process that's happening now towards that um, promulgation. And once the regulations are promulgated, um, that will then allow the minister to um, protect the, the whole astronomy research. So you socially uh, accept it? And, uh... I think there's a lot of communication that's required. And sometimes, you know, with you know, the community, they sometimes misunderstand things. So I think there's been quite a lot of interaction and um, communication outreach in terms of the impact of this act um, in that local area. Good. So it's with, yeah, there's challenges, but, um, yeah. Yeah, who is providing the reporting systems and, and the new receivers for these telecommunications? Um, at the moment, uh, there's been work. I think they're converting the, or they're reusing the existing receivers that are there. Um, so all the existing telecoms dishes, I understand there's some development happening um, with the team in Cape Town in terms of upgrades and that. Um, so I think the primary focus now is actually just to get the, the, the actual dishes in operational condition. Because if you look in Ghana, um, they've had to actually change the whole, uh, well, the dish is about 50 years old. So they've had to work on physical, mechanical work um, before they can even concentrate on the receivers. So I think the team there, um, yeah, they're busy looking at that as well. Mm -hmm. so we were speaking before about uh, the interest of uh, establishing more formal collaborations at the level of science, yeah. both with Australia and South Africa, in terms of having opportunity to fund some common I don't know, students or postdocs. But I'm thinking that uh, apart from any specific collaboration or participation, I mean, in the SKA, in many of the consortia, I think in general it would be also very interesting to pursue <coughs> not only conversation but maybe collaborations or studies of engineers of the institute yeah. to, to work with you Absolutely. or the other side of course. I think there's an invite from the AVN team as well in terms of the VLBI network. Um, there's certainly interest, you know, if, if um, astronomers are keen to participate in the African VLBI network, um, there's certain, you know, there's room for engagement and the team is you know, welcoming any kind of interaction that we can take forward on that as well. So from both parts, Mirkat and AVN, um, and, and engineering, engineers. and engineers, of course. Yeah. Yeah, because these this projects involve so many different aspects of technology. It's yeah. not only really astronomy, there are many Correct. things involved, I'm sure, of yeah. interest. Yeah. And I think that what you mentioned this morning with the teams being set up in terms of technology development, it's very similar. I mean, the teams are there. It's, we need to complement and share, you know, if we can, and collaborate. I think that would be very good. Ivan? Yeah. When you were talking about the AVN, I had the impression that we were uh, talking more in terms of uh, preparations for SKA yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's really <coughs> long term, yeah. Say. Yeah. Uh, perhaps very long term. Yeah. So I wanted to know if there is some kind of timeline of this commitment by somebody uh, uh, to have uh, a AVN ready for uh, SKA one, so that at least we can do some DOBI with uh, with the with the SKA one need for. I think there's certainly that's something that the um, when we look at the science requirements, and that's a discussion that's happening also in South Africa at the moment. Could there be any linkages <coughs> between Phase one and the AVN rollout? Um, so that is a discussion that is is currently happening um, in SKA South Africa, um, but it's not the, I haven't got the answer yet. Um, so it is an ongoing discussion that's happening at the moment. Um, I think the big thing with, um, particularly with, we're keen on new builds in the African partner countries as well, but the big thing there is access to funding. Um, so we've just got funding at the moment um, for the conversion of the telecoms dishes. So it's, it's kind of slow, um, and we're trying to speed things up as well in terms of the conversion. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us something about the, the integration of yeah. Um, that one slide with the timelines, um, what we plan on doing is definitely starting with science for Mirkat. Um, it, the plan is still to do five years of survey um, for Mirkat. We're going to do late integration. So the ARV consortium has now um, sort of worked on their rollout plan for, for SKA1 MIT. The idea is that Array release 3 of SKA1 will be the time when the first Mirkat dishes get integrated. Um, by array release 4, the whole of Mirkat, all 64 dishes will be um, incorporated. 
So that's been documented in the, the rollout plan of ARV, but it's a late sort of incorporation of Meerkat so that we can actually do that Meerkat science and then um, incorporate into phase one. Twenty twenty two, I would say. Yeah. More questions? No? Okay. This is thank you to both of you. Thank you very much for this excellent talk.